Hi, welcome to this uh, panel about the importance of data portability and um, APIs. So uh, let's start with a, a round of introductions to see who are on this panel. Um, uh, maybe each one can introduce yourself. Uh, Monica Posada, Research Fellow for the Joint Research Center at TG Connect. Can you say a little bit about... No? Almost. <laughs> Almost? Okay, sorry. Yeah, no um, so can you correct it and uh, say, just make it a, a short opening statement, You can, whatever you want to say in yeah, a few minutes. So um, I'm actually working at the European Commission, that's correct, mm. but uh, on the Joint Research Center, which is the... Uh, the um, uh, knowledge service of the European Commission who provides uh, um, scientific support to DigiConnect and oh, okay. which is one of the main um, policy, policy DGs uh, working on, on the data strategy. So um, I am actually uh, working in the digital economy team and uh, we are busy um, doing research to support the definition, uh, to support uh, the definitions of the policies by providing um, evidences, scientific evidences and technical support when, when the policy DG needs it. So one of the topics that we are looking at is data portability and, um, and um, data intermediation. We have uh, provided support to the definition of the Digital Governance Act and, and so on. Thanks. Um, my name is Shelby Switzer. I am a fellow at the Beck Center for Social Impact Innovation at Georgetown University in the United States. Um, I lead up our intergovernmental software collaborative where we essentially try to help state and local governments collaborate on software um, products. So that can look like open source products, it can look like data exchange and interoperability and shared services, um, a whole host of different things. Um, a lot of issues that come up are around um, data sharing issues and digital identity. Hi, um, I'm Hans Jörg. Um, I'm the CDO and co-founder of Odriga. So uh, Mikael said there will be data intermediaries. So here I am. Yeah? So we are a, a data intermediary in the field of groupware and email and files. Uh, so we founded the company actually in 2011. So that was even before Article 20 was in place. And we were very happy that CEU baked our business model into a whole uh, you know, law in a way. Um, and also, of course, we were very heavy about DAPSI. And um, yeah, I will, of course, second many of the statements Mikhail did on data intermediaries in a way. And I probably can provide some additional evidence from practice uh, why this is probably one of the more successful paths to improve data portability. Cool. Um, yeah, so I have a, a first question to, uh, to every panelist. Uh, so um, we're talking about data portability at an API conference, uh, conference. So what do APIs have to do with data portability? Sounds Fill it in any way you want. OK, <laughs> so um, last year we organized when we were doing some uh, analysis on the role of API on digital coordination. Uh, we did a specific analysis of the legal aspects of APIs. Uh, with uh, it, it was a multi-stakeholder uh, multi uh, event where uh, public, private practitioners were talking together. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, event in which we got um, uh, very nice insights on uh, the actual uh, status of the implementation of data portability. So it was very curious to, um, to understand from, from the speakers that actually data portability back in, in 2021 uh, had uh, zero euros of, um, of, uh, inf for infringements on, on data portability, which was very uh, weird, taking into account that uh, 250 million euros were, um, were, were uh, penal penalized uh, to actors uh, uh, by breaching the Article 6, which is the all the consent uh, also in the GDPR. So we got, uh, so this is a very important point, and we were doing analysis on this very same uh, seminar on why is this happening. And uh, the reality is that uh, data portability is, is not operative yet. So there were 236 um, companies that uh, were requested to provide the, the, the personal data of individuals. 
and uh, only 10% of them had already uh, um, uh, systems in place to provide it, but the process were very typically very long and not uh, actionable. So you got a, a dump of your data and yeah, what can I do with it? Nearly nothing if you are not uh, tech savvy. So that's a very interesting point that we got from that. And there were, there were a lot of um, discussion between private and public practitioners on uh, what are the implications of actually um, um, operas operationalizing uh, this Article 20. Companies declare that they are a threat that, uh, so they do not know the limitation, where are the limits of data portability. They were saying that they, they were scared of being, um, of exposing their, their business values. Uh, no, this, their business, uh, their unique Secrets. business opportunities, yeah. And, uh, and therefore, that's one of the things that they were saying. Uh, but in the end, so m most, of the, of most of them uh, agreed that the APIs will be a, an easy solution to make data uh, available, and they all have the, the capacities to do so, uh, even though uh, for certain SMEs, so, so small, medium enterprises, it will be a load or on, on their to add this, uh, mm, this uh, functionality to their, uh, to their tec technical stack, because it will infringe some costs. Most of all on the security. Maybe I'm talking a little bit too much. So, so don't, don't these companies want their users to be happy? You know, they want they don't want to say, hey, this not is good as for long our users. They, their it. business are involved in okay. this. But uh, that's, I mean, to be honest, that, that's also logical. Uh, business are not, uh, yeah. they need to leave something. Privacy, yeah. uh, <laughs> but this is a very important point yeah. that you can, I mean, the problem is that you don't have solutions. I mean, yeah. if, if this is not allowed to open, then um, there is a, a lack of competition. Hmm. So if the, the data is not uh, moved and, and the services, you are you as a final user are locked in. Hmm. And this was one of the things that data portability in the GDPR was meant to do, hmm. to allow the data to flow, to allow more competition. To, uh, and that will, uh, that will indeed uh, benefit citizens and Companies, but not all mm. companies. Mm -hmm. So I leave it there yeah. because otherwise I won't speak too much. So <laughs> please. Um, so why are we talking about this at an API conference? Um, I'll keep it brief, but really, when I started researching data portability and different products a few years ago, it was kind of right around when Solid was getting started. Um, the only way that you could do data portability was to maybe export data in one massive file or a zip file. Maybe it would be emailed to you from different sites um, if that functionality even existed. Um, then we started seeing more of a move towards import-export APIs where maybe some of that was automated. Uh, but I think now the real opportunity is actually automating that um, or having real-time or live APIs for data sharing. Um, so that progression, I think, is really interesting. Um, I think that's why we're here to talk about it at an API conference. Um, yeah, maybe I can, I can uh, add a, a little bit of anecdotes from, from our history in a way. So when we started back in 2011, there were still some sites that didn't have even uh, APIs, right? So we had, I think, we, we always called it Cable Canada. So it was a Canadian ISP who wanted to have a contact uh, import from their competitor, and there was no such API. So they wanted screen scraping from us. Uh, actually, one of our very early competitors was bought by LinkedIn for their screen scraping technology uh, in 2013 or so. And then all the existing vendors reached out to companies like us. Um, and actually, we dismissed that. Yeah? So because we analyzed, uh, can we offer a service, you know, a robust uh, continuous service based on screen scraping? And there are tons of legal issues. There are, how do you sign a contract with a, with, with a provider that says, I can help you import uh, data from customers from your competitor when you are not in control of the screen scraping process. They can change it all the time. Yeah? So how do you make a contract based on that? Um, then we did, so we also do big uh, platform migration projects for ISPs, and they tell us, here's our database. Yeah? Um, so we, go that we did that. Yeah? Also, we did directly go to an Oracle database and um, pulled the data out. 
But we also try to avoid that if possible. And this is actually what we did a lot in Dubsy, uh, doing some uh, work to lift that data. Because even if it might be more efficient to go to a direct database access in order for performance re reasons and so on, it's much more of a problem in terms of repeatability and um, you know, um, uh, robustness of the whole process. You know, our whole process benefits a lot from having different APIs we can work on and not digging into a lot of databases. And then there is people calling us with files. You know, like we have here tons mm -hmm. of PST files uh, with emails and all the stuff there. And even though we also did that at times, uh, if there was no other reason, we also always say people, no, don't do it, yeah, because you know it's it's. Uh, it's not always recent data because you do that file generation only once. You're so you know the, you don't have a notion of a delta and everything. So yeah. So in in this way, APIs are I think the main concept to go with uh, in order to really get the data in the right way. And maybe one final aspect which um, goes in a different direction. I think it al also depends on the on what you think about as an API. Yeah? I mean, you can also think about the file export as sort of an API in a way. Um, and, and I think you also need to take into account that APIs, even though this is a very technical place here, are not just technical uh, artifacts, but socio-technical artifacts, actually, because APIs are governed, so you cannot easily just use an API. Um, sometimes you need to register, you need to get an API key, all these kind of things. Um, so this is also uh, issues we have to deal with a lot and which um, yeah, might be inhibitors also to data portability, even if APIs are there. Cool. Um, I'm very curious also what the what the audience want to ask. I'm going to ask that in a minute. So if you're thinking of a question, then after this question, I'll ask one from the audience. Um, so the next thing I'm curious about, so um, I keep being puzzled, like why do we have so little data portability in the lives of non-techies uh, or in, the, in our lives at all? And uh, yeah, we touched upon like, oh, well, that's why the EU is now making all these laws to make that happen despite the, bis the obvious business interests uh, of not building it. And... Um, um, but I, th I think, yeah, how do we, so APIs are machine readable, they're not human readable. Uh, zip files that you get from, because some company complies with the law, are not usable. How, and especially maybe a techie or an, an uh, office worker who is specialized in some data formats can work with it. But how do we make this equitable and how do we make this usable for also non-technical people and everybody who uh, uses technology and uses the, the internet? Um, and uh, yeah, what uh, what is the usability and the equitability uh, aspects of it? I was thinking maybe Shelby had an idea about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think there's a ton here. Um, I think, firstly, I th we should under like we should try to seek to understand all of the people that we're trying to build for. Um, so. I know I'm coming from an American perspective, and some of the issues that we deal with are just a lack of even universal broadband access. Um, I'm not sure if that's a big issue over here, um, but how do we even start to talk about data portability for folks who don't have easy access to the internet and maybe are having to constantly recreate email accounts or get new phone numbers um, because they're just using temporary phones and SIMs? Um, so I think we need to really center like all uh, those user groups, especially um, when we're thinking about building for everyone and not just the more technical folks, um, and really incorporating human-centered design and user research and usability testing into our product development and not just thinking about this as a data issue. Um, you know, you just said that APIs are socio-technical contracts, and like definitely the tech part of this is the easy part. Um, exchanging data, creating a good hypermedia format, um, thinking about how we pass around authorization contracts. Like, we haven't figured those out, but they're not that hard. The hard part is making these things inclusive, um, changing the culture, and building ways for everybody to be involved. Cool. Is there somebody from the audience who'd like to ask a question to the panel? Yeah? But I think that's just calling API and that will solve all the problems. It's kind of challenging because you know what happens if an API changes a lot? What happens if the API is not well designed, it's too cost? So can you imagine some principle that most of the good API designers will follow to get this data portability? 
principles that a good API should follow? That's a good question. Um, maybe I will um, combine my answer with, with also picking up very shortly on the, on the previous question Mikael had, because I think it's, it's uh, a lot related. So I think what one needs to take into account also is like, how, this, how did this start in the beginning? Yeah? The, what the EU had in mind is a lot about having people, giving people the freedom and remove the stickiness from a certain provider to give them the freedom to switch to any other provider, like do with your mobile phone or something like that. Um, but in, in, in a way, data portability, like we just <coughs> discussed it today, falls very short on that because it's just a very tiny part, as you said, like so the actual data part is very, very thin in here. But, um, you know, for, for an end user to really go from one service to the other involves so many more steps. You know, it's sort of signing up, maybe even choosing and understanding, like, you know, how can I put the data um, in the destination account? Maybe I need to understand the destination provider first to remodel whatever I build within the source. It's not just copying over data in many cases, right? And um, coming to your question, I think um, one needs also to take into account a little bit the maturity of the domain. So Article 20 is very generic across um, um, you know, any business, in a way, or any, any domain that deals with personal data. But many of these domains are not very standardized, or that, that don't exist so many standardized uh, models and so on. And I come from the domain of groupware and email, so we had the luck there were even existing standards, and still we struggle with achieving data portability because it's not easy. Yeah? So uh, it's even impossible in some very new domains, you know, like a super new idea, how do you do it, data portability there? Yeah? So in, in that sort of way, I think um, data portability will never be 100% be solved at any given point in time. Um, but I liked a little bit the analogy uh, Mikael put into place of this, you know, chaotic world with, with mm -hmm. islands that are sovereign in a way. So there will always be some wild islands where still stuff is happening and it's not so super portable for a while. And there needs to be some time taken and some community effort or some intermediaries which actually uh, fill into that uh, in order to, to achieve portability. Mm -hmm. I hope so. A little bit. Yeah, and also maybe, um, so in, in uh, this is very technical indeed, but actually there is already some um, guidance for uh, how to document APIs. So one of the main things of APIs that can be, uh, there are already um, like open API, I think there is uh, several, of, uh, several uh, sessions on it. So they, they define um, the good practices on how to document your API such that in, in a, in a machine-readable format, such that uh, it takes no time still for developers to, to be able to consume it without knowing anything. It's really, I mean, one good practice, technical practice that I'm sure that Michael will, will, will know better maybe than on the technical side. <laughs> Um, is, is to follow these kind of, of uh, standardizations. We have uh, examples of how um, the, the, um, uh, it's another directive of the, of, of, of the European Commission is the Payment ser Service Directive, which uh, that's not obliged uh, the, the actors to, to, uh, to use APIs, but uh, to specify um, uh, interfaces to communicate. And since there is uh, a lot of willingness to do so by all the actors, uh, they have got together and, and, and um, they have uh, created a standardization uh, models to, um, to, to define banking uh, APIs. And it has built up in, in record time. In two years' time, PS, P, PSD2 has been implemented the standards are working perfectly, and all the banks have digitalized in, and 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 the mark and the digi uh, the banking sector has uh, changed its uh, structure because there was willingness from all the actors indeed. So we get back again to how to incentivize all the actors to th to to understand that data portability is the way to go for mm, the vast majority. And then leave it to the industry to develop that common practice exactly. with the, the domain uh, expertise. Cool. Um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll just add to that. I I'll echo like there are definitely good practices that you can look into around documentation and versioning APIs, and I think it's definitely possible to do that well. I mean, you can just look at Zapier as an example of managing lots of different versions of APIs and integrations. 
Um, to me, the harder part about the design of this is around um, user consent of data. So if you have a network, like a federated network of data being shared for one user, um, what happens when the user revokes consent for a given service in that network, and how is that then propagated or um, communicated? Uh, that to me is much harder. <laughs> I don't have an answer. The, the, so yeah, that, so that's been a, a suggestion. I'm just going to continue that because I think that's an interesting topic uh, about the, how do you manage the consent of the user then. Um, so I think the what the solid project proposes or what personal data stores propose is like okay the normal model is you have a, a monolith application that has the data inside it and then at some point uh, I want to move it out there so I come knocking oh actually can you get the data out now uh, and then solid puts that on its head and says well the data is with the user and the personal data store that might not be in the user's house but it's at, uh, under the user's control and uh, responsibility and uh, then the application is separate from the data, and then at the moment that the user wants nothing to do with this service anymore, they have the data, so they're, uh, you know, they have the key to their own data, so they're, they're able to do what they want, and they can directly go to some other place and directly say, I'm gonna share my data with you without, and don't have to go through this first party and um, give consent. Do you on top of that, uh, so the Digital Governance Act is also working on, on the definition of intermediation services, which are meant to do so as well. But keeping the data, also keeping the data on on whatever holder that that is uh, and actually sitting on the data. That was yeah. so. That was going to be my next question. Okay. Then but then if then uh, I just have one comment, which is that um, oh crap, I think I just lost it. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to my <laughs> About the consent, okay. Uh, you can come back to it later. So yeah, um, data intermediaries, uh, I read about them uh, the day before yesterday when I was making my slides, and I said, oh cool, there's this thing called data intermediaries, and people have been talking about this for years while I was doing other things. And um, so what is it, and what is the connection with the Data Governance Act? So the Digital Governance Act is defining uh, data in um, intermediation services as, uh, so the, the aim of, of, uh, of, of, of Europe is to, to um, moderate the, the, the huge power that current uh, um, uh, big techs have over our data. And uh, the, the way they, they, I mean, they recognize uh, the value that uh, these companies have, uh, have um, uh, provided to, to, to us. So we have good services, we, we can do things that we couldn't do it before, but uh, the problem is that we cannot get out of it. They, there is no real competition. We are getting closer to mono, no monopoli monopolistic uh, practices, and that is not good for anyone. Um, it's, it's better to have a more competition such that we know that there is fair competition among uh, several actors and uh, the value is not concentrated only in a few players. So um, for this, the Data Governance Act, Act is trying to introduce these uh, new actors that are aiming to um, put themselves in the middle between the data holders and the, um, uh, the data users. And they are meant to be, um, uh, to ensure that uh, the data transitions, uh, transactions, are um, are agreed, so there is there is going to be a check on. Uh, so this user has uh, has done has uh, provided this data for these users to this to to um, to these final users, and that's it. And they can uh, take back this this consent. They can uh, uh, make it bigger or shorter, and and that's it. So. Um, and this is meant to, to be addressed also. Uh, and APIs will have, a, again, a very big uh, role on it because mm, all these check-ins should be done through, uh, through these uh, interfaces. And I leave it there. And is this for when your data, so now your data is at a big tech platform and that might be flowing to you know, Cambridge Analytica, which it didn't mean to happen, and or to some advertising company, maybe with or without your consent, is it meant for those data flows? 
to third parties, or is it really for when the user wants to move from supplier A to supplier B? So mm, the data intermediation services should be in should be uh, an uh, um, an external actor that checks these things. So it cannot be the data holder, right? And 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 so on. And yes, it it has to be in the middle. But um, yeah, it will have to be in the process if this is what you mean. It, oh, it so where is the data moving to? Could it the be data has to be movi moving uh, again as before. So the, right. the, the only thing is that there will be a, um, uh, the data intermediation service will not allow your data to go to Cambridge Analytica because mm. you haven't granted uh, use <coughs> either to that uh, user mm. or to the use of, uh, of this data. This is the, the, the role of the data right. intermediation services. Right. And could, could this also be used to like Say you want to um, supply your health data to some cancer research, awesome. but you want it to be anonymized first, and you want this to happen well, so that the um, and or if some statistics. Uh, yeah, you have mm. to give the the exactly. So that those are uses, and uh, yeah, mm. not necessarily uh, the the. Um, so the the anonymizing, I am not sure it's mm. included in the data intermediation okay. role. But uh, I cannot be 100% sure. But well, but there are algorithms that do that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Th there might be other actors in the, in the yeah. chain. Mm. Mm. Cool. Um, sorry. Maybe yeah, one ahead. short, very practical yeah. example also on, that, uh, on the value of that role in a way. I mean, even though I'm advertising a little bit for myself, but I hope you can. <laughs> uh, you, you, are, you are OK with that. Um, because data intermediary is also wording, you, some or most people might know the, Google, uh, the data portability project, which was funded by Google, Apple, and so on. And they in the docs actually have two operational models which they envision. So they, you can either install it on the side of Facebook or whoever you are as a provider and do the direct transfer to the destination upon request by the customer, or you might have an intermediary in the place, yeah? uh, even though there doesn't exist uh, one right now for that. Yeah? Um, and the interesting practical thing is, if you think about it, yeah, so Facebook or Google or Apple, they might be able to do connections to many different destinations in a way, um, even though most of these require registration for an OAuth key and everything like that. But for very small providers, it will be very, very difficult to maintain, um, you know, manage all the registrations and all the infrastructure and so on um, in order to have that happening. Yeah? So I think there's also a, a, a notion of scalability here or, uh, you know, an economical role which those intermediaries can help to scale the solution space for data portability. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. is the one that we, we have observed that is more uh, advanced. Uh, also, we have seen some um, insurance that is also related to banking and is, is, is basically uh, jumping in. Uh, the health, uh, but this is, this is a particular case, as, as you were saying. So uh, uh, health data, it's, it's uh, very personal and, and people do not like to be sharing it with everyone, prefers to do it uh, um, under certain con conditions. So uh, what we've seen is that the development of this is, is going into the um, data spaces that are in particular uh, the European data spaces that the former <coughs> speaker was talking about. Uh, on, on health on health data is quite advanced and uh, yes is, pra is is thinking of using APIs as a minimum uh, interoperability mechanism already uh, but it, it is not yet uh, fully fully uh, developed um, so yeah I will say that definitely the finance sector is the more advanced mm. that we have that observed. Mm -hmm. That would be really cool if the health sector would become as uh, well data portable as the finance sector. It's one for me personally. It's one of the 
stupidest thing when I go to uh, even two departments in one hospital. You come at the appointment and they ask you, okay, but uh, can you tell me exactly what you told this other doctor uh, yesterday? And then said, well, like you have the same computer screen. I said, no, 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 we're not allowed to share your data. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm there as a patient. I'm in their hands anyway. They can cut me open, but they cannot <laughs> look at my data. <laughs> yeah. It's so stupid, such technical um, uh, stupidity. So uh, yeah, it's, it's legal because technically <laughs> it's, it's possible, but uh, right, yeah, yeah, it's so legal, it's, legal, it's really, really uh, legal stupidity. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> let's let's call it. Cool. Well, lots of uh, lots of innovation to do. And I would just like double click on the healthcare example um, with fire, for example. I don't know if that's gaining much traction here in Europe, but in yeah. the states, it's gotten way more traction just over the past couple of years with higher need and use cases with COVID. Um, so I think that's just a cool example of like an interesting hypermedia focused API spec um, that's st starting to have a lot more use cases and more working groups creating more domain specific standards and vocabulary. Um, and also because of how personal that data is, I think it's a good model for like the type of sensitivity that we should really be thinking about all of this data with. Uh, top on that Sorry. also, Australia has also adapted this fire uh, standardization. Yeah. We're going to have to take the rest of the uh, discussion to uh, to after the session. I guess we'll all be around and we can uh, talk to each other uh, for the whole evening. Um, yeah, just maybe uh, in in one in one sentence, like uh, DAPSI is finished now, right? It's for three years we've had all these wonderful projects and it's taken us on the journey. And sadly, this journey has ended. But obviously, we think. This was just the first step. Now this is where the real things are going to happen. And thanks to Dupsy, you know, all these things we can foresee and that we understand now will stand on the shoulders of Dupsy as the giant. So what do you think uh, is going to happen next? And, and where do you think the world of data portability will be moving in the next five years? I just really hope to see more of it in the States. So really excited cool. to watch what's happening here and see what we can learn um, from what y'all do. We were trying to envision that some three or four years ago when Dupsi was uh, there, like, you know, how uh, when the law was actually proposed, you know, like, how will this be in five to ten years? We should know somehow, yeah, so we can anticipate and build a solution that covers mm -hmm. everything. Um, but at some point, we actually stopped that discussion because we found that, okay, that's really, really tricky uh, to find that out. Um, so I still probably won't give you a prognosis uh, by now today, but I think a, a very important role Dupsi played, and I think that was also the idea of Dupsi, was to make to put a spotlight on this Article 20 and to tell people, okay, this is a new right within the GDPR. And I think the whole reason and the whole point that we are discussing that right here and that we stress the importance of API and so on is a very important part of that process. And I think this process will certainly continue. Trigger but in which direction? I don't trigger know. a snowball effect of innovation. I mean, of course, coming from the European Commission and uh, the the high um, the, the 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 big goals of the GDPR, I would really like to to see uh, the data portability more operational, and uh, delivering on the on the goals of uh, why the, the regulation was put there. So to increase uh, to give back uh, some um, uh, some power over the our data. Uh, to to improve uh, market opportunities and contribute to a fair um, uh, competition in the digital market, and uh, yeah, to get uh, to get those goals uh, yeah. being a reality. Cool. But a little bit of more work is needed to to maybe defining a little uh, a bit better uh, what are the limits of this data portability and and make everyone um, buy in. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for being on this uh, amazing panel. Let's uh, give our guests uh, uh, um, a round of applause. Our great guest, uh, Hans-Jörg Shelby and Monica. Thank you. Thank you.